Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Friday Show. For those of you that are new here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I talk about the news, world events, and then Friday, it is about the conversation. I go through the comments on the last week of videos, and then I reply back to you. More than a show, it's about having a back and forth. But actually, a big update to a story I covered this week that just happened this morning. You know how we talked about that there was a big HBO leak, there were episodes of Ballers and other shows that were leaked, the script for Game of Thrones came out, but not the video? Well, reportedly, video of episode four has now leaked to the internet. But as odd as the timing is, a spokesman for HBO said that this leak was not part of the hack, saying the leak came from Star India, one of HBO's distribution partners. So that's just an update to a story and not information I expect you to act on because you are better than that, he said sarcastically, knowing what 40% of the audience would do with said information. That said, let's talk about Monday. Monday, we talked about no more Scaramucci, Russia in the news, the HBO hack, Chris Christie popping up, Tomorrowland fire, and the huge update around the Baltimore PD investigation. On the mooch, Nick Parit wrote, I don't support Trump and frankly Scaramucci seems like he's full of hot air. Give a man a little bit of power and he will get too big for his britches. Though he was entertaining to watch, it's the same kind of holy shit as this real life type of entertainment we have grown used to. Zach David wrote, I think the mooch was hysterical but even in this environment and even under this president, I don't see how he could have stayed after that super profane and unprofessional interview. So Zach, that's the thing. We live in such an unusual time. It is hard to tell if someone is just a loose cannon and there's just, there's too much going on and they're not able to keep up with it or it's all part of a plan. I mean, thanks to that New Yorker interview where Scaramucci calls up the reporter and he's talking about Steve Bannon sucking his own cock. I'm not Steve Bannon. No. I'm not trying to suck my own <laughs> I'm not trying to build my own brand off and trying the president. How he says he has to go because he has to go tweet something to make Reince Priebus go crazy. Thanks to that, we know certain parts of his shtick were calculated. That he was putting things out there in the public so that he could steer the conversation and insinuate that someone was guilty. But at the same time, the fact that he would call up a member of the press and not say, hey, by the way, all this crazy shit I'm about to say to you, it's off the record. That's crazy. And then the screaming about leaks but then accidentally leaking information. It's fun while it lasted. It was like if a caricature came to life. On the Baltimore PD story, Amaya Zulf wrote, to me, cops wearing Body cameras is no different to CCTV cameras. It's not like they'd have them built into their eyes, black mirror style. You clock in, you turn your camera on, you do your shift, clock out, then take the camera off. It's not bad, it's not an invasion of privacy, it's a safety measure. Seven Swords wrote, if an officer is responding to a call, they should activate the body camera the moment they step out of the squad car. I don't feel we need to see all the smoking and joking, but they should activate it moments before responding to any incident. And I have to say personally, I'm more in agreement with Seven here. And this is for a few reasons. The first is bathroom privacy. If you have an always on camera, if you go into a restroom, you have to worry about the privacy of others, and even yourself. And then of course there's conversational privacy. If the cops are not on a call, they should have the freedom to talk to one another. But if an officer is heading towards a crime, they're in pursuit, they leave their vehicle, they're patrolling on foot, yeah, 100% it should be recorded. And there's also the second benefit when you're not recording all of the time, that's a, that's a lot less footage. You have to keep in mind things like storage and cost. And that's my personal opinion. If you have those cameras filming at those times, it keeps officers honest. And I think it will actually protect officers from false claims. Then let's talk about the Tuesday show. Tuesday, we talked about the NCAA YouTuber content controversy, the JK Rowling fake news story, and the breakdown of the craziness coming out of Venezuela. On the college athlete choosing his YouTube channel over his football career and scholarship, Patrick Arguello wrote, why would anyone donate money to this guy? His education would have been paid for in full. All he had to do was follow the damn rules. Many students would kill for that opportunity. Fuck that noise. Glacera wrote, this is what happens when you have YouTubers blowing up and making it seem like easy money. It inspires people to give up very real opportunities with very secure futures in order to gamble it all away on YouTube. And not a flamingo wrote, so he's studying for a marketing degree and he just made headline news off this fiasco with the NCAA. Sounds like he's gambling for free publicity through controversy. The question is, if the short-term viewer gains bring in more funds than a free ride through college saves. And I have to say, not a flamingo, that is 100% where my mind is on this story. It's his big swing. He is a he is a rocket launching into space. The question is, can his rocket ship hit escape velocity? That being the speed an object needs to reach to escape the Earth's gravity. Because if he's able to make the most out of this story, he has national coverage, he has people like myself covering it. This could be the breakout moment for his career. From just Tuesday and Wednesday, he went up 30,000 subscribers. And his first video since his announcement video has done pretty well. But once the spotlight is off of him, will they continue to pay attention? That's the part a lot of people don't think about. Hey, I wanna, I wanna throw something out there. Some of you who are old schoolers, you'll remember this. Remember Marina Joyce? The Marina Joyce controversy was one of the biggest things to happen on YouTube at that time. People didn't know she was kidnapped, she was in a cult. There were crazy conspiracies. She gets a huge number of subscribers from it. The main video in question goes from relatively 
Unknown to 40 million views. While everyone's trying to figure out what the hell is happening with the situation, the videos that come after get 7, 10, 14 million views. But there's a difference between watching something and taking a ride with someone. Just a year later, Marina Joyce is getting around 110, 140,000 views per video. And depending on your post schedule, if you've monetized properly, that might not be enough to live on. And on Clissera's note that people are dropping these secure jobs to, to go for YouTube because YouTube money seems so easy. This is why whenever anyone asks me like, you know, what, how do I make sure I have a successful YouTube channel? I always try to make sure to include, there's nothing that's guaranteed. It is incredibly hard and very rare. You never know and you can't control if people will like you and they'll share your stuff. And I'm not saying don't pursue your dreams. There are people that risk it all and they accomplish everything. But I think that the, the more you look out there, the more successful entrepreneurs and CEOs out there who made incremental changes in their lives. They test, they try and build their dream while they, you know, they deal with their regular day to day. And they decide instead of taking a blind leap off a canyon, take off the blindfold to, to start trying to build a bridge across the canyon to make that jump a little bit shorter. There's no one way, there's no one story. I think he should have still taken the deal, but I do wish him the best. On the JK Rowling story, Meg Sutton wrote, you say all the time in your videos, it's okay to make mistakes, but if you apologize, Apologize, it's okay. JK Rowling did all those things. She commented on something out of context that made her angry, realized sometime later that she did not have all the details, and apologized. I'm confused as to why she looks ridiculous here. And to Meg and all of the other people that were angry about me, sending some mean ass comments my way, you, much like JK Rowling in this situation, are missing details. Rowling promotes the false information that Donald Trump just ignored a handicapped child. Goes on this small tirade. Then, several days after this story has been debunked, she apologizes to the child and the child's parents, but there seems to be someone missing there. Oh, I remember it was the actual target of her anger, the person that she helped defame, the person who in this situation she slandered. For comparison's sake, if I went on a Twitter rant and I posted a video which didn't show the entire situation and it was at a JK Rowling book signing and I'm like, look, she didn't even, she didn't even acknowledge the small little girl in a wheelchair. And then it turned out that JK Rowling had actually had not only an interaction with that child, but like a big, seemingly meaningful interaction, a one-on-one. -on -one. It was the first person she interacted with. And then it took me about three days to acknowledge my mistake, but then the only person I apologized was to the little girl and her mother, but not to the target of my anger, JK Rowling, who now, in the eyes of millions of people, is a person who ignores people with handicaps, who views them as lesser and is made uncomfortable by them. Give me a fucking break. If that's not an example of fandom over reality, I don't know what is. There are plenty of examples you can use at any given time to say that Donald Trump is a disgusting sleazeball, but that doesn't negate all all the wrong the person you like did. There's a difference between not liking someone, being disrespectful of someone, and just lying or perpetuating lies about someone. Then let's talk about Wednesday. Wednesday, we talked about the fear of YouTube censorship, huge phone case recall, the Venezuela vote update, and that horrible air transat flight. Side note, the airport in that story for some reason started following me on Twitter. On the air transat story, Omega-6 wrote, the air transat thing is BS. They could have deplaned and rented a couple of buses to take the passengers the two hour drive to Montreal. Honestly, it probably would have been cheaper. And Omega that's what made this story so painful to me, is you must feel so close. They were stranded on the tarmac for six hours for a 30 minute flight. Rare Raindrop wrote, while the airplane scenario is bullshit and horrible, why is the answer always more government? This legislation seems like just another scenario of the government pushing itself in where it is not needed. Yes, airlines and airports should have standards for treating passengers in situations like this, and in this case, it seems that they did, but that the particular flight crew ignored them. Then again, it's Canada, and they seem to think the solution to everything is to insert state control over it. And to that Raindrop, what I would say is I am personally for less government in general, but I do personally believe the government needs to be inserted in places to protect people. I mean, we're talking about the airline business here, a business where it feels like the airlines treat their passengers like cattle. The seats are getting smaller and smaller, the experience is worse and worse. In general for them, it's a numbers game, not a comfort game. It's the reason why recently in the United States, the courts had to go to the FAA and go, hey, we need to revisit the issue of the quote, shrinking airline seat. The amount of room people are getting on a plane is getting smaller and smaller so they can put more people on the plane. It creates a far more cramped and uncomfortable experience. It's argued that it could make an evacuation more dangerous. And of course, those are lesser examples, but when we see stories like the Air Transat one, it, we're reminded that we are just numbers to these companies. And unfortunately, since the only thing these companies care about is money, you have to threaten their money to make them care. On the fear around YouTube censorship, Milvio Delian wrote, why would YouTube censor the creator instead of just taking ads off the channels deemed offensive by the advertiser? It would seem much simpler than just doing a blanket ban of content. They do know that now in a way, if you 
watch a lot of car content, then you get car-related advertisements. Well, Milvio, I feel like this is connected to advertising, but it's also not. It is connected to advertising in a way, because one of the big pushes to focus on this content came from the adpocalypse situation. Like I said in the last story, one of the best ways to get a company to do what you want is to threaten their money and YouTube jump. But in YouTube's defense, this also seems to be a part of a bigger initiative as well. But these two different things play in the same world. And I do believe that the videos that are getting their ads knocked off and the videos that are being put in a limited state are different kinds of videos. As of right now, I've not seen a left or right YouTube creator hit in this sort of way. Limited state, if you don't remember, is when all social elements of the video, all advertising, everything is removed. It's just like a video living in the void. And like I said yesterday, I hope my concerns, fears of those in the community are not ever fully realized. And whether they are or they're not, it's always good to always be talking about it so they know that we're paying attention. Then your name is actually Edgelord. Edgelord wrote, YouTube is done for. It's time for people to create a new platform funded by viewers. Something like Netflix, but with actual freedom of creation and no forced narrative. Illegal stuff and porn excluded, of course. A site with the original interest of the internet in mind. But what I would say to that is yes and no. Do I want to make and focus my time on building a YouTube competitor and being a part of it? No. I've been asked to be a part of many YouTube competitors and the answer has always been no. But I do believe that creators need to be on different platforms and new platforms. For example, over the past two years, despite not getting paid for the videos I post there, I've been building my Facebook page. Also building up other social because I like posting there, but also if my YouTube gets screwed over, I have a place to talk. And I also believe that creators' main source of income should not come from YouTube themselves. Focus on merch, fan funding, subscription services. Much of the inspiration for DeFrancoElite.com was uh, Steven Crowder's pay subscription service and Rooster Teeth's pay subscription service. It made me realize there was a safe, smart way to grow my audience, business, and be able to do so much more. And if we make money from YouTube, fantastic. If we get sponsors, great, but we'll never be at their mercy. And even if you don't like YouTube, I think it is good for your business, good for your show, good for your whatever to keep posting there. Because at the end of the day, you want your content in front of as many eyes as possible and YouTube's got the eyes. And then there was the Thursday show. Thursday, we talked about the Trump phone call leaks, Nebraska State Patrol's unnecessary pelvic exams, and Michelle Carter's sentencing. On the Trump phone leaks, Paperboy wrote, What he's saying isn't great, but I kind of see where he's coming from. He's been ruthlessly battered by the press over an 18-month election cycle, with many things being taken out of context. What we've seen in these phone calls is that he really does want to get things done and make America great again. He just doesn't really know how to do it. Travis Warriors wrote, In my opinion, I think the phone call shows a weak man being president who was never meant to be the figurehead of the United States. If you care more about your appearance and behind the curtains you are wishy-washy, then you really are not a strong man. You would be a weak, deceitful person relying on smoke and mirrors to make you look like a powerful leader. So Paperboy, I will say, I do feel like Trump has been battered by the press, but he's been battered for legitimate things and non-legitimate things. Being friends with Trump supporters, I am aware that many people see Trump as a victim of the press. And if you view someone to be the victim there, you're going to be more and more in their corner. You're going to focus on the journalists that got stories wrong, took things out of context, and you might end up ignoring some of the very legitimate things that to many people freak them the hell out that this man is in the most powerful position in the United States. And for both sides, I just want to say it is important not to forget that reality exists. It's not just black or white. That said, I have some mixed feelings about this leak. There's part of me that looking at the transcripts goes, oh, okay, this is evidence that Donald Trump publicly lied. After reports came out of Turnbull and Trump having a horrible call, Trump tweeted, thank you to Prime Minister of Australia for telling the truth about our very civil conversation that fake news media lied about. Very nice. But this transcript shows it was a horrible conversation. In his own words, he specifically states, this is the most unpleasant call he's had all day. Putin was a pleasant call. So there's part of me that goes, yeah, boom, Trump showed as a liar in a tweet where he called the media fake news. What the media was reporting on was true. But at the same time, there is a voice in my head that says, if this can be leaked, what else will be leaked? Don't even think of a President Trump, think of any president. If the leader of our country can't have an open, candid conversation with another leader of a country without fear that that conversation will be leaked, how can one effectively govern? Also, will world leaders feel comfortable speaking to the president knowing that the White House is so leaky? Or should we not talk about that situation in a Trumpless White House because Trump is the reason it's happening. When you have a president in the White House who is lying to the public in the same sentence he's calling the media a liar, is it your patriotic duty to expose the president as a fraud? And also with all of these leaks, will it undermine future presidents? If people are looking to leak information like this now, what's to stop them in the future if they just disagree with something? I saw a quote in The Atlantic about this that really made me think. It said, in response to the danger posed by Trump, other American power holders will be tempted to jettison their historic role too. And you 
use any tool at hand, no matter doubtfully legitimate, to stop him. Those alternative power holders may even ultimately win. But in winning, they may discover themselves in the same tragic position as that Vietnam-era officer who supposedly said he had to destroy the village in order to save it. And I feel like that's a really interesting note to end on, and if you're one of the three people that actually watches to the end of the Friday show, thank you, and let me know what you think about that. Hey guys, I just want to thank you for another fantastic week on this channel. Whether you're just watching, you're liking, you're commenting, you're sharing, maybe you're part of DeFranco Elite and you're helping us fund what we're doing. Thank you, thank you a million times, thank you. But, that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in, I love yo faces, and I'll see you Monday.